<laughs> it's muted. That's easy. Oh. <laughs> no, it wasn't not good. It was non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, it does not. <laughs> the camera took off now. Yeah. No, 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 don't, don't. It, it, it just turn it around. Okay. So, uh, thank you, friend of our friend. <laughs> for tweeting us about the broadcast being mute. Uh, Lips recognition is available. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so, um, Antonio Martino analyzed the Argentinian corpus of laws, 30,000 pieces of legislation, and concluded that all of them were useless except 3,700. And the Argentinian Senate adopted a, a motion to start deleting the useless pieces of law from the books. We don't follow any of it, of the 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's still good. But <laughs> IBM is, for me at least, surprisingly acute observer of the consequences of, of, of blockchain. And especially in terms of resource allocation in the Internet of Things. So imagine uh, any legislator that today can measure the consequences of a decision. Like very simply, a mayor says, okay, a one-way street should be reversed in a, in a city. And the consequences of the decision being collected and visualized not only for him and his team but for everybody through simple tools like Waze or, or, or Google Maps or whatever other routing system and for that to be immediately visible to everybody yes congestion got better or no congestion actually increased and so the decision being confirmed or reversed very rapidly and under objective objective measures. So I think that uh, there is a decent opportunity for forward-looking um, policymakers to realize that exponential trends can have a positive impact in uh, debating, adopting, implementing, measuring, and updating uh, best practices around the world where they can be copied and uh, and uh, implemented uh, elsewhere. And of course, this requires transparency, accountability. Uh, it requires the process to, to be um, uh, visible and not opaque. Um, and, and there's a lot to be to be done there. So in the the fundamental thesis of the network society is that it doesn't matter which incumbent interest sponsors some mainstream media article uh, taking any of these to paint them as a fad because that is what is happening over and over again as you look at them in context you realize that they represent a deep and wide wave of change that is really unstoppable. And then the question becomes very simple. What needs to be done uh, from the point of view of individuals, of communities, of enterprises, and societies at large to align oneself with this change that is coming rather than working against the grain of history? And when that alignment is, is, is decently good, you know that you will be or you should be able to ride the wave rather than being swept aside by it. And, and uh, there are very, very compelling reasons for this to, to, that for, for, uh, to, to say that this is actually important. Um, on one hand, 
our societies are becoming too complex to be sustainable without delegating increasing amounts of decision making to automated systems and you know from the simple daily training of allowing spotify to decide what is the next song that you will listen to uh, that is delegation of your emotional programming actually uh, to things that are much more um, important like our airplanes being totally automated except for the psychological pretense of having uh, pilots until six months ago when the pilots themselves became a, or one pilot became a, a a mortal liability to to a plane with the consequence that we now understand we need to endow these machines not only with autonomous decision power but a desire to survive and as a consequence an ability to disobey there is no reason why any pilot should be able to program a plane to crash against the mountain. And when that happens, the, 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 the plane should be able to say, no, thanks. I don't want to die. I don't want to kill 200 people. You can go to hell. I'm not executing this order. So what is the role of an individual in a society like that? What is the role of individual dignity, of self-fulfillment, of uh, uh, of, of impact and purpose uh, in a very materialistic point of view you know I'm not talking about spirituality or metaphysical uh, implications I'm saying I was in Greece two months ago uh, th three three months ago 50% of the people are without a job how can a social contract survive the society telling half of the population that they can go and die in a ditch. It's impossible. And the social contract itself needs to be fundamentally rediscussed in the face of this level of, of change. And it doesn't matter that communism lost and capitalism won, because capitalism cannot exist without the market and, and the machines can create and go and market for themselves in space or on Mars, whatever. But as long as we stay human, we need uh, a, a, an infrastructure that is shared and that can sustain us as humans. And, the, and, and, and one of the best demonstrations of how concrete this is, is one of the most interesting decentralized networks that has been born in the past few years, which is ISIS. Uh, when a Canadian citizen takes a machine gun and starts shooting in the parliament in the name of ISIS, that is the perfect measure of the misalignment of the signals that society sends to its members. Members, so the United States decides that it should bomb Canada. Uh, bombing apparently won't solve the situation. A, only giving the role to people who can sustainably understand that they are an important part of society uh, can do that. And, and that is enough, because telling people that what they need is just to exist is, I think, the solution. They, we cannot and should not pretend anything else from anybody, because we are 7 billion people on the planet. But we don't know if 7 billion is enough to actually step up to our next challenges. Whether it is Ebola, whether it is the asteroid coming, whether it is climate change, whatever it is, we cannot afford to squander brains. And that is what we are doing today by the millions. So if only we understand that that is our most precious resource, however it comes about, uh, we, we can take good steps to, to achieve a chance of uh, continuing in our project for the foreseeable future. So that's uh, what I've been uh, working on for the, for the past uh, few years uh, under Network Society uh, Research as a, as a nonprofit and uh, have fun and the privilege of, of talking to 
amazing people like you uh, all over the world. That's my partially mute um, introduction to, to our conversation. And would you mind telling us a couple of uh, sentences about you? Uh, you arrived after the presentations. I, I came in when you unmuted. No. Um, so I missed it too. Um, my name is Arn, and I am a, in my heart, I'm a technology evangelist involved in looking at new ways to apply the blockchain and other related technologies to matching work and product at the global level to buyer and seller and to create new business models for creating companies that allow for a more dynamic reality of people scaling up, scaling down, spinning in, spinning out. That's why I'm here, and I'm a cohort with Joel, and I'm always delighted to be here. Thank you. So, um, chairs, if you have a desire to sit. Yeah, so. okay. Good, thank you. Uh, I, yeah. I think uh, having a few minutes with, with your hand is, is okay. Yeah. Um, so, who, who, who wants to, to speak? First of all, I am, I am delighted to have, not enough, but there's at least a few women. <laughs> uh, it, 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 is, it is wonderful, and thank you for coming. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a struggle from both sides to, to make sure that the gender balance is, is semi-decent. Uh, so, thank you. And I don't want to call you out, but if you want to speak first, that's cool too. <laughs> uh, I do have a question. Yes, you please. mentioned IBM as being this observant of what's happening in the decentral, in this technology space and IoT as well. Any other um, bigger companies? Well, um, so so I have been um, I have been invited to consult. Uh, with or or to talk at at various banks, uh, um, you know, even even nation states. I I've uh, been um, um, called to to address the Italian Parliament. Uh, I met with uh, the government of Guernsey, which is a, a very interesting opportunity because uh, the entire nation is sixty four thousand people. So I met with the cabinet nine ministers, and, and, and they are all excited about what kind of future they can they can design. Uh, their minister of labor, if I'm not mistaken, is very proud of having been on the uh, pirate radio ship that came out of the movie. I don't know if you've seen it. That there was this, you know, when when radio was uh, a national monopoly in 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 uh, in the UK and and then it has been liberalized and decentralized and deregulated, right? So that was kind of a wave of, of liberating culture and technology that he sees has similarities to today. So there are really uh, very different players from technology companies to financial <coughs> companies to governments uh, that are all extremely keen in in understanding first and then applying. Uh, what they can to to these changes. Do you see one that would create like a, more or less a platform for people to build on top of, or sort of create maybe a fabric? For so, so in my view, um, it is too soon to talk about standardization and the likelihood of uh, an, what is called the industry standard which means basically for me that a particular um, strong industry player and uh, a, a, a large organization imposes <coughs> its solution to everybody else uh, could win is almost zero. Uh, especially in the Internet of Things, not even consortia led by Cisco or others have been able up to now to impose their approach because the stakes are on one hand so high and on the other hand there's so much that we still don't understand technologically and through their implications. For example, uh, I don't know if of, of how, how many of you know that Google and Facebook are running the risk of dying in 16 days. 
Right. Because the safe harbor agreements that for the past 20 years allowed European citizens' data to be held mm -hmm. uh, in the United States uh, has been repelled by the European Union based on the Snowden revelations. And the US had until January th uh, 31st, 2016, to update its laws that would convince the EU that the protections that were fake were real and no update happened. And as a consequence, starting February the 1st, it is going to be illegal for any uh, American company to collect uh, uh, EU citizen data on United States servers. But they were busy. They have been busy transporting it. <laughs> well, the hypocrisy so far, yeah. of the EU governments is clear. Uh, but that doesn't matter from a business point of view. So, for example, Microsoft Azure uh, is now managed by Deutsche Telekom in Europe on separate servers. And when you decide voluntarily to break up your cloud from one to two, that is the first step in an unstoppable process where finally the world will realize that in order to create value, we shouldn't build larger haystacks in the search of better needles. That was an approach that was marvelously exploited and giddily uh, leveraged by the NSA and, and, and anybody else with, with beautiful vulnerabilities that everybody could pick it back on. Uh, and and it is, it's got to stop. Uh, you know, there is a very, very simple reason. Uh, well, I don't know if it is simple, it's clear to me. Uh, a surveillance society cannot evolve. If I loved a black woman in 1966 and you were my friends and wanted me to have the right to marry her, all of you would be in a criminal conspiracy because it was illegal to do so. But you could help me because maybe we wouldn't be discovered. And yes, you would have had the time, which came in 1967 when interracial marriage became legal, to convince legislators and 50% or more of the population that, 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 you, that I should be allowed to marry the black woman I loved. But in a surveillance society, uh, no change can happen because everything that is illegal before becoming legal is criminal. And, and whoever enforces legislation will be in their full right to do so and stop society from becoming more tolerant towards behaviors that were prohibited before. And, and there is a very long series of, of this, especially in the US, you know, being able to drink alcohol, uh, it not having to have as a doctor to impose unending suffering on a, by law on, 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 a, on a person who is ill. Uh, the rights of, of homosexuals, obviously. Uh, um, uh, recreational marijuana, uh, which is now supported by the majority of the population of every state, regardless of the state of legislation, right? So, so the reason why we cannot afford surveillance society to be implemented further with the excuse of terrorism is because it will kill society. Because a society that does not evolve is brittle. A sufficiently large stimulus will just break it. So we need to develop trust between humans. We, we, need, we need to uh, tell uh, our governments that they went too far, uh, that, you know, in India, people were ready to die in acts of civil disobedience in order to tell the government that was a legal ruler of the people that the government was wrong. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I want to go back uh, and check whether the word terrorist was used against Gandhi 
it was used against um, um, uh, Martin. Ma well, the, the guy in, in South, uh, Martin Luther King too. Uh -huh. yeah. No, I, I was referring to the Mandela. Mandela. Mandela was was a terrorist, right? Until he was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. So. Uh, Anyway, that was a question about. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's, a the there's a there's a difference between Gandhi was you know preached nonviolence and 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 you know used nonviolence and Mandela, they were like you know violence is the way to you know change our, change the system. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying actually terrorist for Mandela was the right word, <laughs> but it was okay. He was for the right reason, right? You know so. <laughs> he, violence was his means, as opposed to Gandhi. That was not the case. Yeah, and and, and you know it's funny because because uh, uh, it is it is uh, it is abhorrent by many to be a pacifist too, right? So so we have a way with words that that we can we can use any way we want. Uh, back to back to the blockchain. Um, it is actually, as Javier said, an incredibly powerful tool for building trust, because the trust is not imposed ex ante. It is gained through the results of a series of actions that actually tell you, hey, actually I can trust that person. Look at that. And, and it, you, you don't need to rely on a central authority to, to, to tell you that a password, passport is, is valid. Today in Europe, people travel with perfectly valid passports that have been printed on absolutely genuine paper with with the right machines and 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 they are still you know in the hands of of terrorist organizations but as technology evolves and you want to make it practical um more sort of not imposer but enabler do you see any anyone or candidates that you know to enable for mass adoption of this yeah, so, so I, I see a series of extremely interesting immune reactions that want to delay the adoption. And the incumbents have very little chance to be the drivers of the change because it disrupts them too much. And the probability that they will be able to be leaders of the new uh, power structure is minimal. So it is not their own interest to accelerate the change um, at all. In, just to, just to uh, quote a couple of these uh, uh, immune reactions, um, well, the first I already mentioned, it is the bit license in, in, in New York. The cost of compliance with the regulatory requirements for a startup uh, that uses Bitcoin in the state of New York is comparable to that of being a bank, which is, you know, incredible. It means that any acquired position, if you are already a bank, gives you incredible leverage and, and competitive, unfair competitive power uh, with respect of, of, you know, being a, a, a scrimpy startup. In Spain, they very recently, six months ago, approved legislation that double taxes solar photovoltaic installations. Mm -hmm. uh, an extremely effective disincentive. Um, in uh, Greece, it is illegal to work. not to be connected to the grid. And the official justification is that, oh no, if everybody were to do the same, then what would happen to the grid? It would destabilize. Now, of course, no change is possible because the different behavior is always going to be done by a minority to start. So the argument, if everybody were to do this, never applies. But the real reason why they don't want you to disconnect from the grid is because the taxes are levied on your electric bill. And you become a vassal. You know, it's 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 vassalage <clears throat> because the state has total capture on on you, and you have no recourse. 
uh, or another one, uh, 23 and Me. Um, you know, uh, when 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 Martin Luther uh, translated the Bible, what he said is that there shouldn't be a priest that you needed to consult in order to interpret the sacred text of God. And what the FDA said is that all of you are too stupid and you need to rely on the priesthood of doctors to interpret the sacred text of your DNA and you shouldn't be allowed to do it by yourself. And the first reformation had uh, it was followed by 200 years of, of war and you know now 23 and me and then the FDA found kind of a truce and and uh, the the kids can be legally sold again but it was a very interesting uh, example of, a, of an immune system overreacting oh another one was in Hawaii January 2014 um, since in Hawaii also it was required to be always connected on the grid, uh, the uh, electric utility said that it couldn't absorb any more excessive power generated by too many solar panels. So you could not legally install any more solar panels in Hawaii. And it took them six months for the world to laugh at them until they realized that that was not the right path, that they should amend the legislation. So you could put in solar panels even if they are not connected anymore. So there are a lot of, lot of signs of the shift um, creating this. And, and immune systems can be dangerous. You know, if you're allergic to nuts, uh, what your immune system will tell you, you want a nut? I'd rather kill you than have a nut. And evidently that is not a desirable outcome even if the system thinks it is doing the right thing. So um, these are these are some of the reasons why incumbents are extremely unlikely to be able to shift into the new paradigm. Um, yes. Did you mention in your talk that the things are moving from a centralized system to a decentralized system? So one of the centralized system we have is this telecom networks where we have a duopoly of AT&T and Verizon for wireless networks. How that can be made decentralized? Yeah, uh, there is a, a great example. Uh, in Hong Kong in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, there were very widespread protests, mm -hmm. as in many other cities around the world. Um, and the authorities, uh, turned off the uh, <coughs> cell towers mm -hmm. so that people could not coordinate. And they used uh, uh, Firefly, which is a mesh networking chat app, where uh, just hopping from handset to handset, mm -hmm. the messages <laughs> go around without needing the cell tower to collect mm -hmm. and then rebroadcast re or, or, you know, the network had a mesh organization. Okay. Another great example uh, is provided by the, the CIA, uh, which uh, funded uh, the uh, Internet in a Suitcase project, uh, $40 million of investment, and they were very surprised to find it uh, at Occupy Wall Street uh, that used Internet in a Suitcase to set up communication centers and rely on Tor and, and whatever other communications. and. Um, it is, it is, you know, uh, the the power of uh, unimpeded communication between individuals mm -hmm. uh, is pretty important, uh, at least in the U.S. Constitution, uh, and uh, uh, you know, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, etc. Uh, and uh, it is in danger. You know, uh, when the NSA corrupts the standardization process from the National Institute of Standard and Technology so that the <laughs> algorithms that uh, uh, are implemented for encryption have convenient vulnerabilities, it is so wrong 
because they do it under the pretense of national security and they imperil the US national infrastructure because those algorithms will be in the Cisco switches, in the Juniper switches, they will, they will be everywhere. And, and just like the NSA know about it, the Chinese hackers will know about it too. Uh, just a week ago, it became proven that uh, the blackout in the Ukraine that uh, took away for an extended period of time uh, electricity from 80,000 people was a coordinated attack uh, that uh, used uh, zero-day vulnerabilities on SCADA controllers, industrial controllers, simultaneously wiping the servers that would need to be rebuilt in order to regain control of the controllers, and uh, launched a denial-of-service attack uh, against uh, cellular communications so that it wouldn't be easy to know who was actually without electricity and what was the ex extent of the blackout. And, uh, you know, whether it was the Russians or Russian hackers uh, uh, who were just having fun uh, or, or whatever else, it is evidently a test because 80,000 people is, is, you know, in the big s scheme of things is, is regardless of their suffering. Is, is, is not too big, but I think that from last week onwards forever, any national security, um, you know, department that doesn't realize that decentralization is a must is impeachable. Uh, because it's just simply something that, that no nation can afford to be exposed to these uh, vulnerabilities. I'm curious if you recall whether it was the mainland Ukraine or Crimea? Uh, mainland. Yeah. Uh, Crimea is Russian. Well, now Russian occupied, yes. <laughs> you mentioned um, the benefits of more and more automation coming into the network because it's more efficient. Uh, perhaps in the example of autonomous vehicles, no one's doing their makeup and making breakfast on their way to work when they have an autonomous car. It's not dangerous anymore. Um, but we've all seen Terminator and Skynet and wonderful <laughs> visions of the future like that. How do we make sure that these uh, network systems truly do protect human life and protect their own networks, but not at the, at the risk of human life? Yeah, so so there are two um, two very important points that you are making there. First of all, uh, we are very rightly concentrating and are bi biologically programmed to do so on the negatives. You know, from ev for for forever, uh, mm -hmm. if we were paying attention to a beautiful landscape as alertly as to the saber-toothed tiger, we would not survive, we wouldn't be here. Since we paid more attention to the tiger, that's the reason we survived. So that is the reason why we pay attention to negative news much more. Mm -hmm. And for our entertainment to represent dystopias rather than utopias, mm -hmm. however, Statistically speaking, it is undeniable that technology is not a zero-sum game. For the past 10,000 years, other than being a few million people, we are now a few billion people. And unless you believe that that is wrong per se, because there are radical ecologists who would prefer a planet with no humans in great shape, rather than a planet with many humans that is complexly, technologically transformed in a way that they don't understand, uh, well, that means that this is good. So that technology helped us. And we just should, you know, for me, the answer to probably all of our problems is more technology, OK? So the same is with, with autonomous cars. Um, all the um very proper 
um, thought experiments of the trolley problem of, oh my God, will the car swerve to save a school bus and kill me, uh, are fine. As long as we don't forget that it will occur one in 10,000 in 9,999, whatever the number is, lives will be saved. And we cannot forego those lives being saved because we concentrate on the one that is tricky. Um, so, yes, autonomous cars will save uncountable number of lives and make a lot of other people um, happier because the fact that all our cars are sitting there doing nothing rather than us driving them is a demonstration that we like driving but in small measures no car makers will be able to survive because we will need 80 90 percent fewer cars on the streets because they will always be in motion rather than just sitting doing nothing and you know the car makers that are now fanatically concentrated in increasing the number of cars they make enough to pretend that they can break the natural laws or tell their engineers to break them vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Volkswagen are, are just in the wrong path because what they should try to do is to build fewer cars rather than more. That is why Apple uh, earns, I don't know, I think like 70% of the profit of the handset market, even if they make a tiny fraction of the total number of handsets. They know how to make money with less rather than more like Samsung is trying to do without success. Now that your second question is, is uh, even more important because for at least 5,000 years, we lived under the illusion that we cannot and should not step up to the challenge of creating uh, science first and then an engineering of morality. While, without giving it the name that we use today, we were creating a science of astronomy, we were creating a science of herbs, a science of uh, you know, uh, um, uh, animal husbandry. All those fields were open for our inquis inquisitive minds but the dogmatic assumptions about Bronze Age knowledge were fixed. And, and now we have a problem because the Google engineers that are building the robotic cars are doing this under closed source. They are doing it uh, with no precedent and guidance and no real uh, understanding of the import of, of, of what they are doing. Uh, I don't know if you were here when I said that machines must be able to disobey. Uh, the example I gave was of the airplane yes. uh, that uh, pilots could program to crash and the car, it's the car too, but the plane should be able to say no thanks, right? So what are the conditions under which machines disobey <clears throat> our moral decisions too? And, and so the rules for that must be known, must be inspectable, must be agreed upon. And also, you know, we can recognize that, that uh, morality is not universal. Uh, uh, if the Google car sees that I'm alone in the car with its um, camera and the GPS, um, shows the car that I'm in Saudi Arabia, and the image recognition shows the car that I'm a woman, will it start? Because in, under local mores, it should not. And, and Google exited uh, China for these reasons. They didn't feel it was morally right to give over the uh, email accounts of loggers that China wanted to prosecute. Yahoo decided it was fine, and a guy was jailed 10 years. Uh, so, so and, and, and of course, corporations are machines. They are even persons, imagine that. So um, corporations already don't have moral 
uh, fiber. You know, when 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 Volkswagen squanders a hundred years brand in the pursuit of growth <coughs> is rather short term in terms of, of, of what they what they should be aiming for, right? So that is that is happening very slowly. It is definitely out of sync with, with what we need. Uh, I spoke at a conference in Seoul a few months ago entitled The Social Implications of Artificial Intelligence. And, and, and yes, part of what I was speaking about was, was this. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. You seem to think something positive happened with 23andMe and the FDA. Um, I don't see it as a positive thing. First of all, they were never not allowed to sell their kits. They just weren't allowed to get the health uh, results. But you could always take your raw data and send it off to another website like Prometheus and get your health results. But what they ended up doing, as far as I can tell, is pivoting. And now, Ann Wojcicki's doing the genome-wide association studies and selling the data to the pharmaceutical companies. Whereas previously, she kind of wanted to go over the counter, direct to the consumer, and have a lot more idealistic. Uh, yes, they, they positivity they, behind her and what she's doing. But in order to survive, exactly. she caved. Yes, and I don't. I see this as a win for the you know when innovation meets regulation, I kind of innovation innovation of what you think. But it did. I, I don't see that happening here. I, I agree with you. I agree. With you. Yes. And any time the FDA wins, I might thumbs down on it. <laughs> but, and I think one very interesting thing that's happened, you've been following Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Okay, <laughs> me too. And, uh, but she did something marvelous in the state of Arizona. Do you know what she did there? In the state of Arizona, you no longer need a doctor's prescription to get a blood test. You don't have to fight for the right to know your vitamin D content or your cholesterol or anything like that. You can just walk in to one of the Theranos or any place and get your own results. So the middleman was taken out. And no matter what she's doing with her nanotainers and all the yeah. deception, whatever's going on or not going on there. Actually, what I'm interested in is how her entire board of directors is all military. Yeah. And, yeah, that is an interesting question. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 She never talks about the fact that her dad was CIA, which I think has a lot to do with this. Oh, okay. There you go. Hey, <laughs> you are a journalist, right? So you're doing your job. <laughs> Several years ago, I wrote a blog post called Blood Money, all about uh, before she became famous, it was all about her board of directors. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. 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 You call Peter Thiel a pessimist. Why? Well, well it's just a quip, you know, and, and it doesn't matter. Uh, he is always quoted saying, we wanted flying cars, and instead we had 140 characters, right? So so it is, it is like a provocation towards the Silicon Valley startup community to dream big, to want to go to space, to want to bootstrap entire new industries to solve big problems uh, rather than searching for better ways to monetize eyeballs. Yeah. So in, in that sense, it's not a question of being a pessimist. It is, a, it is a, an, a, an assessment of the current state of the tech industry in many regards. And, and, and there are wonderful exceptions, of course, Elon Musk, uh, Peter Diamandis, Aster uh, uh, mining or Planet Labs uh, uh, democratizing uh, access to data from from space for all kinds of purposes. Um, the the wonderful example of what future use of reputation is going to be. Um, it, money is such a dumb proxy for reputation. If my grandfather was a robber baron, that may says nothing about you wanting me as your investor. Mm -hmm. But still, if I have money, you know, maybe you will take it. Uh, but in the future, we will really be able to uh, deploy portable reputation as uh, a resource allocation mechanism. Today, if you uh, like Facebook and, and uh, you post on Facebook and, and build up a, a you know, a, a, a profile 
that that uh, carries uh, value for you, it you can lose it anytime with an appeals process that is laughably uh, superficial. Um, I don't know if I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with Are You Serious, Mondo Two Thousand. He used he used he is a, a wonderful journalist and uh, analyst and commentator and and storyteller of the uh, uh, cyberpunk psychedelic uh, uh, movement uh, and and his legal name is Ken Goffman but nobody knows that he's are you serious and on Facebook he kind of be Facebook decided that that it wasn't enough that 30 years of, of, of writing was under are you serious and uh, so that's very painful but example of the future is when Elon Musk says, I looked at this high speed train project in California and it kind of sucks. I'm a little bit busy with Tesla and SpaceX, but you know, here's this plan Hyperloop. Wouldn't it be great if it became real? And everybody just saying, wow, yeah, let's make it. And there are now two teams, one of them is Peter's, Peter Diamandis. Is, uh competing to make hyperloop real um so um, equity crowdfunding is just a step you don't need to give money you just need to raise your hand and, and you need to say on a future kickstarter let's go to mars and if a billion people say we want to go to mars we will that is they that that's how it's gonna happen. So I have a follow on question here. How can the blockchain be used in a reputation management system? Yeah, so so I, I actually wrote a, a a paper that won a won a won Bitcoin prize, but at the time Bitcoin was valuable. Uh, I, I, I wrote a paper um, you know a short thing, doesn't matter. Um, about uh, using uh, Bitcoin for for space exploration and blockchain for space exploration. Resource allocation is uh, the link between the Internet of Things, the blockchain, uh, reputation systems, and uh, for me, the real moment of the Declaration of Independence of our future Martian colony mm -hmm. is going to be when they bootstrap their own blockchain, when they separate their economy from the Earth economy by, by running their own blockchain. That is going to be the symbolic step. Uh, and of course, in terms of, of details, you know, it's not that blockchain will power our spaceships. Uh, but uh, how we coordinate our efforts and how we decide what what is worth doing that is how we are going to do it I, I, I may say something i, I just yeah, like to encourage yeah. people to come in there are chairs over here so there's there are no some lurkers reason to some heavy duty lurkers i come from a, from from a uh, country that uh, we do not respect uh, government nor laws or pretty much uh, anything that it's a rule uh, not not because uh, we just like to disobey it's just because uh, there's this division I mean the, the government is after the people they don't work for the people and and somehow it looks like Americans believe that the government does work for them because you see your tax dollars becoming nice roads and you know things that uh, that at the end they end up being like contracts for also their friends and uh, and and it seems like the out of all the ideas and the things that have been talked about the main problem is that uh, there is government and uh, and if we can scan our ID. To be recognizable to Airbnb, so you know that the guy that is staying in your house is the guy from the ID. Why do we need Congress? 
I mean, why do we need 70, 80 people to represent 300 million people when today we have the ability to just ask a referendum and let people vote and say, we want it, we don't want it, right? And to also pose the, the topics, what do we want policy making to be talking about? Not what they think is important, but you know, and it's as simple as just saying yes, no. And then it becomes important to educate the people. If you give people the power to vote in that way and take and make a decision in one minute to where we're going as a society, then you better make sure that the government will do what they need to do, which is make sure that people are educated. And and if there's I, I don't have anything against surveillance, but they should be the ones being surveilled. Yep. Right? Why if they work for us, why don't we have a camera in the White House? In no. the I mean and it's and it'll be to the protection of the government too. Let you know like a a, a workers union come and uh, and extortion the president of the country on camera. Right? Why do we have reality TV for everything else mm -hmm. and everybody being surveillance? We are the boss. They are the you know, they are the employees. The public servants, yeah. Right? So Yeah, re representative democracy. And I work for Congress, huh? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, representative democracy is not. It is not democracy. Uh, Churchill threw us a, 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 a gauntlet, a provocation. They, he, he, he said every form of government, uh, uh, democracy is the worst form of government except every other form. Uh, ha ha. It's, it's really up to us, you know? And, and, and when Jefferson and Washington said, yeah, well, I will go to, uh, no, I, Washington didn't say I'm going to Washington, but uh, <laughs> whatever he said, whatever he said, and, and the and the other said, okay, see you in four years, and then they had their horse riding or whatever, and, and they wrote letters. That potentially was reasonable, but today to pretend that somebody should get a mandate and then for four years bye-bye, there's no reason. No reason, you know, company bosses are in, in danger every moment from their boards and, and, and shareholders, or should be. Uh, and uh, um, we, we must really, as, as Javier said, strive to, to, to do better and, and can. So much so that there are now people uh, who are technomad and they still obviously are under the laws of, of any country where they either reside or have a citizenship or, or whatever else, uh, but they are more and more in networks that are abstracted out. You know, uh, uh, um, uh, nomadlist.io allows you to select what is the city where you want to work remotely from based on speed of internet, uh, cost of life, uh, quality of air, um, and, and like 20 other criteria. And uh, when I hire uh, my, my employees for my businesses, I never restrict artificially the pool of talent by deciding that I can only fish from a given city or country. And I always tell them, you know, wherever you are. And the latest was a Slovak living in Dublin. And he told me, oh, by the way, I'm moving to India. Cool. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, and uh, the, the governments are going crazy about this. Uh, the United States is the only country of the world with universal taxation. As long as you are a U.S. citizen, you will always pay taxes regardless of where you reside. And no other country does this. Argentina too. Argentina does this thing? Okay. Uh, and, and I don't know if you know that it is possible to renounce your U.S. citizenship. And, and, and some people do it and there are several reasons you want you may want to do it one of the reasons is because you want to stop paying taxes because you have been living in the uk for 10 years yeah why if there are children there why should you pay taxes in in the us 
uh, and it used to cost about two hundred dollars in two weeks to do so. And then two years ago, it was two thousand dollars and six months. And there are rumors of it being decu uh, uh, increased ten times again. Twenty thousand dollars, two years, and so you see the trend. Being born, being born in in a, in in the U.S. can become planetary vassalage. Yes, you mentioned Peter Thiel earlier. Have you any opinion about sea steady and the concept? Sea yeah, well. C, so C, the, the, the Seasteading Institute uh, <laughs> wants to study um, how international waters can uh, sustain communities that do not uh, fall under the uh, legislation of, of uh, nation states and as a consequence can host uh, rapid experimentation and evolution of social and technological uh, solutions and um, uh, so the latest uh, um, or one of the latest uh, thought experiments uh, was that they would buy and refurbish an ocean liner uh, a, uh, a cruise ship uh, to be parked um, I don't know 50 miles something like that off the shore of San Francisco connected with fiber optic links and then have coders there that could be uh, cheaper than living in San Francisco uh, but uh, you know on the same time zone and, and whatever else um, they consulted with the uh, Coast Guard and they said we don't care we will just shut you down nonetheless even if you are in international waters um, uh, and and uh, and I don't think that nation states will actually disappear. What we can and are probably already do um, try to to make happen is to make them relatively irrelevant. Uh, it is it is not easy because they have arms and they use them. The nation states kill people, um, but. Uh, you know, bacteria kill people too. And uh, that doesn't stop us from dreaming and doing things that bacteria cannot even imagine. So nation states will be powerless and, and, and there will be things that, that networks of people freely aggregating will be doing and, and they will not be able to stop it. Yes. Uh, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on um, a concept that Jake Applebaum, who's one of the folks involved in the Tor project, has been floating around. And he does a lot of thinking, like he's building software that helps anonymize people. And, um, and you know, he's creating the software that will be used by the good guys as well as the yeah, bad guys. So he's kind of, you know, yeah. I think thinks a lot about, about that. Um, but the concept that, that he's putting out right there is um, trying to think of the new right for an increasingly networked, increasingly AI data driven world is. Um, he frames it the right to be entropic, and entropic is entropy is a measure of randomness or a mm -hmm. measure of unpredictability. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the right to be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's thinking of this as a way to like encompass what does a government owe us. Um, and I guess it's kind of interesting because you know, in the same way when we were talking about surveillance and back doors, you put a back door in something and it's accessible to bad guys as well as the good guys. The right to be entropic, the right to be unpredictable. Is something that, if it's you know, if it's a concept that succeeds, um, it's like it goes to the bad guys as well as the good guys. Um, but I guess I'm just yeah, I'm curious what your thoughts on what anyone's thoughts on that are as as a way to like you know a concept to guide us forward and like what are our future rights past like you know the right right to free speech and all these things. Yeah. So so when I when I speak about uh, the future of morality and tolerance. Uh, I always give a, a, a homework uh, to, to the people who are kind enough to listen to me. And I say, uh, go home and before going to sleep, think about a behavior that abhors you. That is just something that gives you the creeps 
that is is really something beyond what you uh, can accept. And then imagine a society where that is tolerated and that you will be part of it. Because um, there are things, you know, we, we, we all have biases, we all have prejudices, uh, and, and we just uh, understand what is the proper way of, of, of handling them, you know? Uh, and, and it is a little bit, you know, it is, it is at the end of the game unavoidable that we are uh, representing a public image that is not totally transparent and aligned. We wear our masks, we, we mediate our, our stances, gender, race, religion, everything that we say, you know, on those waivers in the, in the, in the, in the hiring processes is constantly violated. Uh, the, the, the wonderful demonstration of this is when symphonic orchestras uh, started to uh, uh, to hear, um, uh, you know, a violinist or a cellist behind the screen, uh, the number or the proportion of female violinists or cellists increased radically, right? And if you asked anybody, okay, are you prejudiced against women? They would say, oh, no, not at all. The guy was better. How can you tell me he wasn't a better cellist? But then where the, there was the screen, the women were as good as the guys, rather than just 10%. Um, now, uh, so, so what, is, what is that we can or cannot tolerate? For example, I, I, I have an implant, okay? Uh, it, is, it is a great conversation breaker. Uh, you can't, give me your finger. Uh, so you can you can uh, feel it under my skin. It's here. Oh. It's an embedded chip. Yeah. And it is uh, it can open doors. It can pay for the subway. It holds uh, the private key of a Bitcoin wallet that is nowhere else. Uh, not on a cloud. Not in a phone. Just here. And for a lot of people, it's just way too much. They really don't like it. And it's great. That is probably 90 percent of the purpose why i put it there <laughs> uh, because it's kind of a you know just just pushing the boundaries a little uh and and, and letting letting you understand that that uh, uh, the, the merger of technology and humanity is in rapid uh, uh progress towards end games that we can barely imagine um and and what is the role of of being human in the future depends on our imagination in redefining what it means to be human and it is to our advantage to do so sooner rather than later because those of us who will <coughs> embrace technology will do it regardless and the others who will choose freely to stay behind, we want society to encompass both ends of the spectrum rather than fragment and potentially pit one against the other, including um, the fact that, according to many, sooner or later we will seed new intelligences that are going to have completely different ambitions than us. You know, the Terminator scenario or the Matrix scenario is not going to happen. We are horrible batteries. No need. Uh, but my childhood dreams of, of, uh, of, of space operas are so naive. I cannot wait for my friend Randall Kone, who is working on backing up the brain uh, in alternate substrates. Uh, I want him to succeed very soon, not only because I want to be able to back up and to restore, but because I want to be able to parallelize my experiences. And one of me is going to take off 
and just you know just to share some crazy dreams of mine uh, the miniaturization process will continue. We will be able to build nanoscale brains. And the reason to do them so small is because a laser beam is going to accelerate billions of them to a speed very close to that of light uh, with an energy cost that is very little as opposed to whatever spaceship. And they will just keep talking to each other. And if a few gazillions smash against Jupiter, it doesn't matter. There are many more. And it will be me just going out and having wonderful adventures, not ever looking back. And, and that is the right way to do that, rather than putting meat in a tin can. Um, so is that going to be human? It's our choice to attempt to extend the definition to that too. And if we don't do that, too bad. It's our loss. Yes. Come on, go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Oh, no. Her. Yes. No, he spoke. I've had fun. Um, you had mentioned you were in Greece two months ago. Yeah. And that 50% of people were unemployed. Yeah. And something about social contact. What did you say to them that would be different than that, that you didn't say to us? Or did you have some way to talk about network society as it applies to economics and individual? I don't know, yeah, I mean, um, I I seldom give solutions <laughs> because not that I don't think I know. <laughs> uh, but because it's 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 fine. It's really you know just like just like I invited none of you, but you showed up. The same. You cannot give solutions. They they really have to find them by themselves. Otherwise, we. You know, just like America exports democracy so happily everywhere, and and, and the Iraqis say, "Stop, please," or, or whoever else. You know, it, it just cannot work that way. Anyway, if I if I were asked, what I would have said, uh, I, I spoke at a conference. It was beautiful. Uh, Two thousand people or more in in the um, largest symphonic hall in, in in Athens. It was really wonderful. And, and yes, I didn't need solutions, but um, uh, but that, actually, then I spoke to to, to a bank, uh, one of the the largest banks in Athens, invited me, uh, and it was it was wonderful. There were it, it was just for the top management, so there were I don't know fifty people in a in a small room, and uh, uh, it was pretty full except for the first two rows. The second row was empty. And in the first row is just one guy, the chairman of the bank, mm -hmm. and then everybody else who couldn't even want to, to, to come close. And so there, I spoke a little bit about about solutions, um, and and uh, definitely, uh, one solution is that we have to stop pretending that the uh, that that the scope, the objective of living, is to work. Uh, it 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 is it has been a means undeniably, but we just make some semantic mistake and we flipped it around and we made it the goal. Um, and society is now just so opulent that we can absolutely afford to realize that people should be able to do whatever they want unconditionally and a lot of people will want to do things that they are good at and that others find good useful but society should not dictate conditions like oh you we, let's say we are in the 80s and you are 40 years old you've been laid off but now you can retrain and then you will go to pension and hopefully die soon enough after that um, and now we are in the whatever this decade is called and uh, when people are laid off they learn skills hopefully fast enough that are obsolete a year later and then they retrain again and some companies realize that that they should let their people learn as much as they can just 
stick stuff in their ba brains, but others are, are, are less ready to have people waste their time rather than being productive, right? And more and more people are saying, well, I cannot keep up. I, I just can't keep up. You know, I, I, I can try to be a productive knowledge worker, but, you know, it's too fast. I can flip burgers, but I cannot feed myself because the minimum wage would ruin the 1% if it were increased. Um, and, and it is all so silly because we really can just very simply say, once you're born, your universal right as a human includes your right to live a decent life. And, and that's it. Uh, uh, most of it is already in the Universal Declaration of the United Nations. Uh, uh, education, health, shelter, food, and society is able to provide it for everybody. So one simple name for this is universal basic income. That is a simple label that is becoming more and more uh, accepted, <coughs> more and more recognized. And you know, and then the naysayers say, oh, but what do you with the lazy? Why would you care? I, I mean, it's not that the lazy are not lazy today. I mean, they are lazy on the job. But why does that make a difference? You know, we pay them $7 some, uh, 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 an hour and they are lazy, yeah. And, and, and so what? It's, it, it, if um, in, in, uh, I, I gave the example of, of uh, uh, public servants, you know, there are scandals er everywhere of public servants, quote, not working. For example, you know, go shopping and, and they are caught on camera while that they are shopping rather than working. Perfect. Let them. As long as the red tape that they would cause to justify their own existence is eliminated because bureaucracy self-perpetuates mm -hmm. in order to procure jobs that are not needed to people who feel, would feel useless otherwise. And <clears throat> we just need to really be honest and, and, and let people be. Because, and it is humbling, but uh, we are all needed to let very few be able and make radical changes in society. And we are all needed. Our society is so complex that it wouldn't work if we were just a few. But it is really true that the bigger changes are brought for what and then adopted by everybody, recognized by everybody as necessary by a few. I, 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 I'm a very modest guy uh, and, and I always say, that people who are modest are self-limiting, <coughs> but I always try to be humble, which means that I, I, I know that, first of all, I'm not the only one, and that everybody else is needed, and sometimes people who are unhumble are right too, <coughs> and that is amazing. You know, if, if, if uh, you know, Columbus were, crazy and crazily wrong because he thought that the earth was two-thirds smaller than he, he believed he wouldn't have sailed and 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 sometimes that's that's needed that kind of crazy is needed and you know many other guys died and we don't even know about them we just know about the one that, that made it so so being unhumble is is, is very good um, recipe for martyrdom of, of various kinds, uh, but the results are enjoyed by everybody else, except the Indians. So when you presented this to a bank, I mean, what did they say? Or did you present it as something that they could do? Yeah, I, oh yeah. Income? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I told them first of all that they must establish a skunk works group uh, a black project uh, that was isolated so that the immune system of the bank couldn't kill them uh, and they should finance them and teach them blockchain, take the best people and come up with an app. And if they didn't do it, those best people would leave anyway and make it happen. And then in 10 years time, 
by the bank if it was worth it. But probably they wouldn't even bother. And, and I just signed up a few days ago with number 23, which is a new bank in Germany that allows you to sign up for an account on your phone, fires up a video conference for the KYC, the Know Your Customer Procedures and Regulations on the phone, just show them your passport and, and, and have a chat with the guy on the other side and boom, you are done. It's so painless, so incredible, and you know, it's a, it's a bank, it's super. Uh, but uh, very, very, very cool. Just a comment on the, on, on the on this fifty percent of the population. One thing is to be unemployed, and another thing is to be not occupied. If those people loved what they were doing, they would do it for free. They would still go to work every day, even if there's not a boss or a structure. People just, you know, just the I mere fact working is so <laughs> working is so hideous that they have to pay you to do it. Right? When you guys do the projects that you that I've heard people say that they, that you do, you do it on your own time and you do it for free. Yes, and on the potential, uh, uh, you know, outcome and the money you're going to make, but you're not doing it for the money you're going to make. You do it because you love doing it. And and there's and this has to do with what you asked. There's not going to be the bad people. There is no good or evil. There's good and people that don't love what they do, or they don't experience love. Once they experience love, there's uh, all that we call the bad people, the people that are violent. And violence is always a result of fear. Right? And fear is nothing else than love turned off. Right? They feel they're afraid. And this is why, you know, you take your Labrador, nice dog, and you start, you know, choking him, and it's going to bite you. Everybody that is biting, that is like the bad people, they're just afraid. And they're afraid because they've never experienced love. Because there's, you know, to experience love, you need to open up, basically. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, forgive me if anything I say is trivial to you. I'm saying it for the benefit of the black boots that can arrest us all uh, on the recording. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, I don't know if some of these things uh, sound incendiary to, to, to any of you, but there are people who feel threatened by these ideas, afraid that their, their uh, existence is going to be uh, put in peril and, and, and unbalanced. And as long as society doesn't allow the freedom of the individual to define and design their own lives, they are right because they are dependent on, on that false security of the stability that cannot be sustained. And, and, and we sustained a lot of our civilization by uh, depredating other continents for the past few hundred years. The reason why we became so alert about sustainability, both uh, ecologically and economically, is not because we became better people, just like slavery didn't disappear because we became better people, but because we don't have other continents to despoil. And, and, and so now unsustainability is unsustainable, so we have to search for sustainable solutions, both ecologically, economically, and psychologically. And, and we cannot afford to, to have people who have very big power and very big fear. So in the beginning of your talk, you had mentioned about that IBM is investing in our resources on blockchain. So what is their perspective on blockchain and what kind of problems they're trying to solve using blockchain? Yeah, um, so, so they published uh, several white papers and they're really good. Um, one of, uh, I, I like one of them especially, where they are looking at the possibility of reforming uh, accounting systems that are linked to the sensor networks of the Internet of Things on, on one hand, and on the <clears throat> on the on the computably uh, transparent uh, information sharing of of the blockchain, and they say basically no more auditing, 
no more auditors, you know, quarterly reports, mm -hmm. fudging numbers, mm -hmm. it's just there. Uh, much more, much nimbler um, equity uh, transfer mm -hmm. and, and uh, wider uh, shareholder participation, mm -hmm. more transparent decision making processes and faster cycles mm -hmm. of uh, uh, resource allocation and adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a, a, a quite, um, quite nice piece of work. Okay. Oh, it's easy to Google. Yeah, IBM blockchain, Internet of Things, okay. so blah blah should come up easily. We also created the Open Ledger project, right? Mm -hmm. Did you hear about the Open Ledger project? Mm -hmm. so I, I, is it? It's a federated blockchain. Do you know about that? Yeah, I know uh, a good deal. Um, I don't think that much has been publicly disclosed yet um, about that, but um, I believe it's you know, Apache licensed. Uh, yeah, they're trying to make an open um, way for businesses to collaborate on standards for creating blockchains that will allow them to uh, just implement them very quickly um, versus having to develop their own blockchain and do their own sort of mining algorithm. So it's, it's an attempt to try to get industry, not standardization, but tools for industry to begin um, building these things quicker and in a more um, connected way. Um, yeah, and there's also some like, um, work on shared ledgers by first principles for um, having multiple banks settle mm -hmm. um, what they owe each other um, mm -hmm. through a shared ledger versus having many different ones that are then settled in mm -hmm. period. Um, so they're, they're doing a lot of kind of like foundational work and trying to get people also just general distributed computing. Mm -hmm. So just the idea that there are companies that can handle databases for transactions and essentially, you know, that's very much changing. So they have a whole blockchain lab. So. Yes. Is there really a need to have banks anymore with blockchain technology? It seems like a lot of the trust or a lot of the utility they have kind of disappears. Uh, you know, uh, whether we keep using the same name, uh, the nature of the organization is going to profoundly change. Already, many banks, I mean, all of the banks see their uh, their branches is a liability already. Uh, and, and some recognize the need of, of repurpose their, their branches. Uh, I love, for example, if it is still there, the San Francisco branch of uh, what used to be um, the Orange Dutch Bank and they sold themselves to some ING. other bank. ING. ING. And I don't know whether they are still ING. Capital first. OK, whatever they are. <laughs> Anyway, that thing in San Francisco they had, I just walked in, went to the barista, ordered a cappuccino, and then I asked her snarkily, and what about opening an account? And she was in an orange t-shirt, served me the cappuccino, and said, I'm a licensed broker dealer. I will be very happy to take care of your banking needs of various kinds, including opening an account. Just tell me what you need while you're drinking your cappuccino. It was amazing. And, and, and then there are these tables with power outlets on top and, and easy chairs. And, and I could totally see myself saying to a friend, hey, I have an hour. Why don't you come and we hang out in the bank? <laughs> right? So. Yeah. Imagine what could happen to real estate prices if we could take all these branches, turn them into housing, and then with all the autonomous cars running around the inner cities, we freed up a lot of parking spaces, etc. that were taken up by cars. Now we can do some more building, real estate prices would come down. Oh, absolutely, they will. Yeah. Well, already, what sense does it make to build an office building if so many of your people can work remotely. Um, and the reason why traditional organizations want people in their offices is because they call them employees that need managers, and the managers tell the employees what to do. And I tell my people, your first and most important task is to make yourself dispensable. Learn what you do so well that it can either be automated or if it is complex enough or creative enough, you can teach it to somebody who does it in your place and you step up to the next challenge. And 
And no, I don't want to tell you what to do. Yeah, we have our mission, our goals, and we coordinate, and then we work together, and you can call it holacracy or, or whatever other faddish name. But the point is that what you tell what to do is the machine for now. And, and people should not be told what to do uh, as long as they are valuable. And if you need to tell them uh, what to do, uh, you made the wrong choice. You shouldn't have hired them. Something was wrong. And, and so if you don't need to tell people what to do, then they can be anywhere because they will do the right thing anyway. They, they, they need to be supervised. And, and so office buildings are useless. They might go to an office. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they want to. Be. Well, you know, they, <laughs> absolutely. I have a team. I have a team in Rosario, uh, Argentina, and, and they decided they wanted an office. And they said, is that OK? Absolutely. Uh, you know, like a dozen people, they didn't want to work from home anymore. They wanted no, to see each other. be with their wives. <laughs> a lot of them are women. A lot of them are women. So, so, and it's funny. And it's funny that that they 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 you know rented this place in a co-working space, and they stayed there for a few months, and then they decided that that was fine, and they went back, you know, very very freely and very autonomously. Uh, Twenty-five percent of the websites are powered by WordPress, made by Automatic a company for, founded by Matt Mullenbach, worth $1.2 billion, 400 people, no office. They are all over the place. Uh, the various groups meet wherever they decide they want to meet, in Vegas, in Hawaii, in London, whatever they want, uh, and they just do their thing. It's, uh, it's wonderful. So when Marissa Meyer insisted everybody come into Yahoo to work, it was, we should have seen it as a precursor. To yes, I was, <laughs> I was personally saying, wow, this is so anti-historic. This is, this is just so amazingly wrong. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I felt sorry. Uh, you, could, you could replace apparently nine vehicles with one, one shared autonomous vehicle, according to the University of Texas Austin study. So that fleet model um, in a simulation was shown to have pretty dramatic effect. I think it's pretty <laughs> when there's really one really dramatic in it. Go somewhere at once. That's the one challenge that they're going to have to come. They both, everyone wants to go home at once, and you can't. No, because because uh, it will be a time-based pricing. Uh, so the the system, the app will tell you you really want to go now. It will cost three times. If you wait another twenty minutes, you pay less, and you will just say. I'll say, okay, I will wait 20 minutes. Are we imagining most of these distributed systems are going to operate like markets with money? Well, uh, no. I said a few minutes ago that uh, a lot of it will be based on, on, on uh, what used to be called barter, but it will be technologically mediated. So we will call it reputation and skill and, and, and whatever else. And, and, and money is, is quite... Uh, inadequate in, in many in many ways. So you're saying there will be tools for measuring relative effort or relative belonging, relative like what are the factors that you would take into account in the barter system like that? Sure. So um, there will be things that you do because you like to do them and you will expect no uh, additional return, right? Um, and then when you need something there will be a very vast number of things that will be available. Like, I'm not paying for this thing, you know? 10 years ago, I would have had to rent a hotel meeting room to do this. And this just magically appeared. Um, so so a, a very high number of products and services uh, will be like, like that. Um, you know, including, for example, the, the live streaming thing we are doing here, this would have cost, you know, it, it would have been impossible even to pay for it 20 years ago. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have afforded it. Uh, and, and, and now uh, it is a bit cumbersome and a lot of cables and whatever, but it works very well as long as I remember to unmute the microphone. Are you not getting paid for this? With a lot of love. Yeah. <laughs> so you think we would be as productive in, in creating the 
of, of living and you know that sort of thing, or would we see a decline once everyone begins working on passion projects and stuff, and those things aren't dictated by like a market style thing? Basically, would we have more stuff, more production of stuff if people were working on everything they love? Less production or like about the same. So, so, so the choice of words is excellent because uh, a lot of uh, economies are dematerializing even under the unrelenting pressure of consumeristic advertising and unending production of unneeded crap. <laughs> um, um, my, my favorite example is 3D printing, where <clears throat> the traditional model is that you come up with something, a dancing pig, in March. In uh, April, May, you have the prototype. In June, you send the order to China to produce a million of them. Uh, they start producing, then the container ships leave China. You start the advertising campaign. Uh, and before Christmas or November, whenever it is, you put on the shelves at least three times the quantity that your best projections, sales projections tell you, because you are panicking that it will be successful and then the shelves will be empty. And then the best projections do not materialize. You break even if you are lucky. Two thirds of the dancing pigs are sent to the landfills. And then the cycle starts again. So when we complain that the latest iPhone is sold out, that is a fantastic demonstration of the right choices that Apple makes because they don't know if it is going to be successful. But they can generate the desire and then, then ramp up production. That's fine. And we just wait a little bit. With 3D printing, uh, there are many advantages. One, the most evident, is that you just produce what is needed and when it's needed. Uh, others are that there are new types of printers that are better at recycling and working on recycled materials, so uh, you close the uh, economic loop. But what I like best is that contrary to the traditional assumptions of capitalism, that you need to deploy capital in proportion for the production line to keep up with the complexity of the output. So the more complex what you create, the more capital needs to be deployed. It doesn't care if it prints something simple and stupid or something beautiful and complex. It takes the same printer. The value, as a consequence, accrues to the designer, accrues to the person who has the creativity and the ingenuity of thinking about something that is that is beautiful and wonderful. So to come back to your question, yes, there will be dematerialization in the economy, both because of uh, sharing of resources that are underutilized today. You know, there's there is what is the ROI of something? The second largest investment of every family is the car after the house. And and the level of utilization is is less than 80%, actually less than 90%. If you drive your car more than two hours a day, you start bitching about it. Isn't that crazy? So as we reorganize uh, utilization levels of these resources better, we will need to produce 90% less of them but we will dedicate our time, you know, to cure cancer, to, to, to educate children on an individual basis, one by one, to learn dancing the tango, whatever we want to do. So we're going to have a follow-on question. So how will the skill-based barter system work? Suppose he's a very good web designer and he has very good reputation and I need some web design work to be done. Scientist, but I don't really mean to pay. I don't know dollars or any of that currency to pay basically. You know, right? Suppose you do it for me. Mm -hmm. You do it for me. Uh, how will I, how will that accounting work basically? How will I compensate him? Sure, Tony. 
Oh, there's, there's actually an app where, like, if you're a hairdresser, you can barter for your UX designer if you need a website for it. Yeah, okay. there's a, I don't know what it's called for that. Oh, but it's only for hair designer. So no, 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 it could be anything. Like, the yeah, cook but, but, would be. So the line for is, uh, but what if we, suppose I have some reputation and he doesn't find anything useful that I can offer him. You just design it and code it and you give the app. I'm joking. Okay. Uh, uh, People have, I think, created automated market makers in their use. I think this is what they do. What the coincidence of wants is the issue there, just no one bothered to make one for skills markets. I don't know. Yeah, so, I mean, so it's be, I may have something useful, say, for example, okay, here's something for me, but I can do something useful for you, and then yeah. you can do it for him, basically. Yes, absolutely. That is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely at one time. But money also allows the on the distance and also time. Because I, he does something for me, but I pay him, which he can use one year later, six months later, basically. Okay. So how do you like a time lag? And also distance lag. Absolutely. Energy. Of course. Of course. So so um, I'm not going to plan and design it okay. tonight, but. Uh, um, yeah, the, the the word maybe is not. We shouldn't call it barter because it is it is it comes with a lot of baggage in terms of how we remember barter. But what I'm saying is that whatever is going to be contribution to the commons okay. of your skills okay. and receiving from the commons products and services that you need mm -hmm. is going to be mediated by nth generation blockchain technologies. Okay that are going to be able to track okay. these things with a fair amount of leeway. The buffer of a social safety net that will sustain you, okay. and, and, and just because you cannot keep up the rat race is not going to let you fall and die. Okay. Right? In other words, it's like with blockchain technology, you can issue tokens. So the web designer can issue tokens against future web work, or if you yeah. have inventory, you can issue tokens, and those can exchange on, on an open market. Yeah, uh, my, my, my view was that, that we will each have our own coin, right? And I am so disheartened by the skill of scammers that pumped and dumped hundreds of, of coins to death and the early adopters obviously deserve to pay the cost of experimentation. That's fine. But there should be a, a slope that is going up. Uh, and, and I am still a little bit conflicted uh, uh, of, of how to prevent scammers to, to take over any good hearted effort uh, because it has been just overwhelming. Right, uh, I, reputation management comes in, so you have badges or reputation type to the issue or the point. Yeah, so so actually, uh, uh, Joel and I uh, were um, wanting to to say something about it, right? No. Yeah, Joel, go ahead. So I think we've decided that uh, network society needs its own crypto equity, um, uh, particularly to, um, maybe you should say something about the, the fund and all that. Yeah, so so uh, um, I, I founded uh, a Network Society Research two, two years ago, and uh, a couple of months ago, I founded the Network Society Ventures, which is a sister uh, organization, an investment fund that uh, invests in early stage startups that uh, we think are well aligned uh, with uh, uh, our, our thinking. And uh, it has all kinds of characteristics and it all its own investment philosophy that goes beyond just the, the technology angle. And uh, we are going to be contrarian in, in many ways because you know we are we are new to the game so it's worth uh, being different rather than similar um, and uh, uh, we will want to experiment with with uh, incentives that can uh, uh, catalyze the volunteers that are literally around the world in network society research the nonprofit 
um, to uh, apply themselves in various ways to provide value both to the nonprofit but ultimately to the to the investment company as well and reward them corresponding so the, the the tool for for rewarding this participation that has economic value is the network society token uh, that is going to be uh, issued and, and distributed uh, based on uh, three uh, activities uh, the first activity is the organization of events uh, where both the organizers and the participants are going to be rewarded. So rather than Eventbrite, where you pay to go to an event, mm -hmm. you will be paid to participate. However, your participation is, 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 will need to be proven, uh, active, and valuable based on an act that will allow you to check in, uh, record, or in some way, document uh, your, your part.
if, if you're inviting people from outside the city, there's a, a guy that uh, teaches a class, at, maybe there's a lot of these classes, but uh, OCAD, it's a design school in Toronto. <laughs> It was just such a, like, everyone in that class seems so, like, well-heeled to attend something like that, and I feel like that guy must be, I can get his name out. Yeah, yeah, totally. No, we, so we do, he we do all sorts of people up if, depending on the scope of the event. Yeah, we love, we love futurist designers, whatever. Um, uh, we do alternative scenarios, and it's really useful. So looking at, like, what would happen if everything collapsed, what would happen if everything worked really well, um, and playing those out. Um, and um, we also, we, I think we wanted to make it kind of like, if you actually imagine yourself in that future, like what would you see? What, were the, what would be the kinds of things you would see? What would daily life be like? What would, what would be the kinds of decision points you'd have to make? So making it as real as possible. Yeah, make it as concrete as possible. <laughs> It'd be like an evening kind of workshop, yeah. very, very participatory. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we don't open up a virtual reality. Be, we actually yeah, we would let Joel post it. <laughs> well, just telling you in advance. <laughs> 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 we're doing some announcements, just one other thing that's been brewing around the community of people. Uh, I have a background in, in technology alliance creation, and I've seen some of the benefits from it. But um, we're looking at creating something called the Alternative Economy Alliance. And the objective is not to serve any one person or organization's goals, but to give a forum and a platform for people to come together and then go off and build those individual groups and focus areas and come back together to share that. And that might be something that uh, anybody in this room you know, would like to explore. The idea is there's so much confluence coming together of great ideas. Is there a venue in which you can come to? And if there is, great, I'd love to know about it. And if not, let's build it. So, so uh, Michel Bowens, the P2P Foundation, is mm -hmm. something that I would encourage you to check out. Okay. Commonstransition.org as well. Um, so, yeah, he he's based in in Belgium. Even if he travels around the world all the time, like like many of us. Uh, so I'm not saying there shouldn't be another, uh, but those are those are platforms that are very uh, we, uh, we share as well. Uh, uh, o U I we share that is also very impactful. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Hey. I want to drink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.